native of Mexico, so I know um, about the, the whole story of the maquiladoras and how you know companies will have these assembly plants close to the border and, and, and the terrible working conditions there. Um, I also graduated with uh, a degree in international affairs, so I understand that governments um, often face pressures from multinationals and all these other corporations uh, as governments are trying to, to uh, I guess, attract uh, multinationals to their country because of the employment, because of the, the well, sometimes they get tax breaks, but because of the tax money and all these things. Uh, and so how do you, how do you um, find ways of, of pressuring uh, the governments to try to enforce these, uh, these different labor standards and such when they also have this pressure of trying to bring more employment into the country and more investment into the country? Is that kind of a piece by piece uh, contract that should always be worked out or, or what kind of pressures can, can actually be placed on, on these uh, governments? Um, the U.S. government development agencies from the U.S. and other countries are investing in various ways and improving the effectiveness of uh, the departments of labor in different countries. But the, the approach, and I would say in most cases and what we learn from the triangle is that there needs to be something much more integral, right? I mean, what are the, what are the social security laws like? For example, in the Dominican Republic, in agriculture, you have a requirement that everybody have health care coverage, except for the fact that in agriculture, 90% of the workers are Haitian and they have no access to that health care coverage. So a lot of this is, you know, are the laws in place and then is the implementation in place? I think this is such a long conversation, I don't want to cut off my <laughs> colleagues from speaking more about it. Thank you. Other questions? Um, yeah, I'm uh, Nancy Lesson with the United Steelworkers Union, um, where we're currently averaging about one death in a steelworker represented facility about once every week. Um, so, you know, my heart and our heart goes out to you, Chris, um, and to your family. Um, but one of my concerns is what is going to put pressure on employers to do the right thing? Um, amongst the enormous pressures they have to make great profits, you know, at the expense of um, workers and their lives and their health. And, you know, reflecting back to BP and the Texas City situation in 2005, where 15 workers uh, were killed, 180 injured, I mean, we were very encouraged to see OSHA at that time. I think it was a, David, you can correct me, I think it was a $25 million fine uh, that BP got. And then several years later, when it was clear that they were not doing what they were supposed to be doing to protect workers, there was another $86 million fine. These are the biggest fines in OSHA's history. Um, got, I think, knocked down to about $50 million, but, um, a friend of mine who's the president of a steelworker local at another oil refinery did a calculation and he said, well, that's about 20 minutes of BP's profits, 86 million, 20 minutes of their profits. Is that really going to put pressure on them? So while I think we have to absolutely support OSHA and its uh, um, move to, to do good regulations and, and enhance enforcement and fight against uh, this climate where OSHA continues to be understaffed and underfunded and under attack. Um, we have to also look to other kinds of tools, for example, criminal prosecution. And I think it was pointed out at the beginning of this panel that the factory owners at the Triangle Shirtwaist Factory who violated ordinances and contributed or caused the deaths of 146 people never were criminally prosecuted for that. Um, but is there a way to use criminal prosecution and think about that? Because jail time for CEOs might get the attention that even an $86 million fine didn't. And I know even in Massachusetts, where I'm from, when we had a creative attorney general, we had uh, two employers that were overexposing their workforce to lead and cadmium, and the attorney general looked at criminal law 
and he got them indicted and convicted for assault and battery um, uh, using a uh, deadly weapon. And so I would like the panel to comment on the issue of criminal prosecution and the threat of jail time. Not that I'm looking to see lots of CEOs in jail, but I am looking to see a lot of CEOs making decisions that protect workers, and they're not now. Thank you for your question. No, I, I think there's no question that, that the uh, possibility of prison time would focus the attention of executives on workplace safety. Un unfortunately, the criminal penalties associated with the OSHA Act are quite weak. Um, if there is a fatality uh, associated with a willful or repeat violation, not even a serious violation, but a willful or repeat violation, then the uh, maximum penalty is a misdemeanor with six months in jail. To put that in some perspective, you know, if, if you harass a wild burrow on federal land, you can get a year in jail. So, um, what I, I think the example you raised of, of state prosecutors or others ta taking these on, I think, is probably much more likely to have an effect unless we change the federal law. Last year, uh, the Protecting America's Workers Act had uh, provisions to strengthen OSHA's criminal penalties, but that did not pass. Uh, and so I think looking at the state level makes a lot of sense. Uh, I'd also like to comment that uh, the opposition to the reform that David just talked about uh, clearly delineated the class lines within the Congress, the class alliances within the Congress. Um, the, the Mine Safety Act, w to which the GOP, of course, eventually voted party line to kill it in the, uh, late in the term, um, that had improvements, you know, for criminal provisions because the Mine Safety Act is too weak as well. But these provisions were the special target of the of the Republican opposition to the to the OSHA related provisions. So I, I I think it's important to understand who's defending who, and to make that very clear uh, in dramatic ways. I would also point out that. Um, the history of prosecutions under environmental laws and others that the Justice Department did at a number of companies, uh, you know, showed some creative lawyering when an administration wants to get busy on it in the Justice Department, and that started under the Bush administration. So I, I, I want to just point out that there is a, it's not only political alliances by party line, it's by class interest as well. was a, a factor in the, in the kind of inhumane conditions that the workers had at Triangle. And um, uh, and the peace rate system is alive and well in agriculture. Right. And one of the hardest workers I've ever seen is a 10-year-old boy in Texas who was harvesting onions and um, bent over in 100 degree heat and working like a grown man, harder than almost any man I've ever seen. And um, my question stems from that because the little boy uh, was wearing a soccer outfit, and he had um, no protection on his arms or legs, and um, he was also using a very, very sharp pair of scissors that were about 14 inches long. And I wanted to ask Norma about um, pesticide exposure, because she worked in the fields, and, um, you know, did you have any, any direct knowledge of, you know, the effect that the pesticides were having on your family or you? Or you know, sadly, even though I was working out in the fields legally since the age of 12, but I had already been working for quite a while before that, um, my earliest memory is in fourth grade, and, and this is actually pretty typical with the kids uh, that we talk uh, to that are out there working in the fields. Um, there is hardly any uh, actual training on pesticides. I myself didn't know anything about pesticides or what they even were or what they were used for or the effects. Um, uh, until I was probably around 17 years old that was the first time I heard about him and how I needed to protect myself and how important it was to wash our hands. Um, sadly, when there are farm workers out in the fields, they're told it's, it's medicine for the plants. And so a lot of people think it's good for them um, and are not aware that they are dangerous and, and you shouldn't be taking them home because then they'll take them to go use home at home as well. Um, and so this is actually very, very dangerous, especially for children because of the fact that um, they, uh, they are just developing. We're talking here about 12-year-old kids um, that are developing that won't, probably won't see a whole lot of effects till down the road once they get older, once they want to start a family, um, once they uh, get older and, and start to develop, you know, 
possibly cancer or Alzheimer's or, you know, there's links to ADHD and all kinds of neurological problems uh, that are associated with those type of chemicals that are being used. Um, but there's hardly any uh, training that, that goes on out there for these kids. Um, and, and of course, it's just one of the many, many uh, dangers that are out there for, for kids that are uh, working. Um, and so, the, it, and, and I did want to add in, in regards to peace rate, I mean, this is something that's been in, in, in place for such a long time. And, you know, it, to put into perspective, you know, the, when you go to, let's say, the grocery store and you're, you're buying a, a pound of onions, you're usually typically paying a dollar, two dollars for it. Yet when I was working out in the fields, and this wasn't too long ago, a big potato sack uh, full of onions, you would get about 65 cents for each of those. I mean, so that's just an idea of the, the low wages that are out there um, and kids that work all day, they feeling like they're contributing to the household. In reality, the most that these kids ever really contribute to a household per year is about $1,000, yet they lose so much more. They use their, their childhood, their health, um, their education, um, and, and a lot of other problems problems that they get. Other questions? Yeah, I had a, a quick question, I, I guess, for, uh, for Judy. Uh, famous uh, Biden quote, uh, don't, don't, don't uh, compare me to the almighty, uh, compare me to the alternative. <laughs> um, I, I remember, I, I, spent, I spent some time right before the uh, Obama uh, planned trip to uh, Indonesia going through factories. And I can tell you that the difference between those that have contacts with the U.S. and those that are that don't are completely different. It's much better than the, as bad as they are. We're not, you know, if, for those in the U, for those that deal with the with the U.S. market, those that don't, it's horrendous. And I'm just curious. No, it's it's a completely valid point. I mean, the the factories that just had significant fires in 2010 were what you would call first tier suppliers to global brands. And the global brands recognize, and, and I have to say, these are some of the global brands that are doing the most to improve their supply chains. And they seek to approve any sub supplier down the chain. They get blindsided by the third and fourth tier sometimes. But for this to happen at the first tier was shocking. and at least the factory fire that happened in December, that factory had just passed audits. So in many ways, you know, we're, we're trying to improve and we can improve. We have some leverage to improve at that first tier sector. We have leverage to improve in the export processing zones that are really dedicated to this, which tend to be better than the other 3,500 factories in Bangladesh. But is there an excuse to to not have at least that first tier get better. And then I think we can't forget what it would mean to improve the better employers. Yes, we cannot get down to the base level, to the, to the poorest. And there are other programs to get to the poorest, to the kids working in the brick kilns that are just off the road from the factories. But if you don't build that middle class, you, you know, I mean, Maybe you could argue that the factory workers are auto workers by comparison within the strata of the Bangladesh economy. But you need them. You need them to do better. And if they're not at least moderately prospering, much less earning below poverty level for their families, how are you going to have a, a, you know, a base of development happening in the country?